On the 2nd of February, on our insert day, we had an assessment panel. We had it planned months back, our teaching and learning team did. But over time, we realised we needed to shift the focus onto one topic in particular, that of artificial intelligence and its impact on assessments. We were joined by the wonderful Fiona Dix, Laura Archer, Richard Harris, Jack Lee, and an IT student named Ben Miller, who caused a bit of a stir with his performance. On the panel, we discussed chat GPT, which has, since November 30th, become a real talking point in education, it's fair to say. This is an artificial intelligence chatbot that through natural language, that is normal messages, can give the user an awful lot for very little input. It's being used a lot around the world for administrative tasks, for writing letters, for, in some instances, creating essays and marking work for students and for creating copy for marketing and for generally allowing people to abdicate the responsibility to write long form because they've now got a tool that can do a lot of that heavy lifting for them, which has raised some ethical and moral questions as to when you should and shouldn't use these tools. So we had a discussion and a bit of a debate about this. In particular, universities are worried about this, leaning as much as many of them do on the essay form of assessment, chat GPT, with a through a few prompts can actually create high quality essays with minimal human inputs. It can chat with you with minimal input in a conversational style, writing content based on your prompts, which shifts the emphasis away from the user needing to focus on the quality of written communication and more so on the quality of prompts and the co-design, the co-authoring with the AI, as opposed to just wrestling with the blank page and creating from scratch, chat GPT has changed the writing process for many people. It can generate data, code, tables, essays, feedback, emails. However, it's trained on data and doesn't scour the internet for search results. It's on a database pre-2021. And it isn't always 100% correct, um, can be convincing, but when you scratch the surface, it's not as coherent or cogent as it might be and informed by real knowledge. Um, it's a simulacrum, a version, a compilation of rationality and reason, which is not always perfect, but a lot of the time it's pretty good and it's getting better. It can't provide information for anything after 2021, but that might be changing. So here's an example of how it looks. I teach the teachers in the evenings at the moment, helping out our teaching and learning team. And I was reminding myself of Waldorf and his theory of curriculum, because I studied it years ago, but I had a, I was thinking, what was that again? I was gonna dust off my textbooks and find out what the theory was, but then I thought, oh, let's just try ChatGPT, and it gave me the most eloquent, well-designed, clear response with examples that, get this, gets around our plagiarism checkers. I asked it for further information on Tyler's theory of curriculum in one continuous chat, and as you can see, it builds up my essay, my thinking for me. It's like I've got an online professor on demand. You can ask follow-up questions. Why? What? Where? When? How? Can you give me an example? Can you rephrase this? Can you simplify this? And it will do so. Microsoft have recently invested a lot in OpenAI, who actually are the team behind ChatGPT. And we're going to see it integrated into Bing, the Microsoft web browser soon. Google are responding with their own version, Bard, which is coming very soon at the time of recording, recording this as well. So it's interesting times. 
here's me thinking about Piaget's theory of curriculum. Now, I always struggled with John Piaget and his thinking, but this helped me to really sort of weigh up and evaluate and extract meaning from his sometimes quite bourgeois theories and really helped me. I read more so than any textbook ever has, I've got to be quite honest. It looks like this chat GPT. Here's an example of a teacher putting in an answer to uh, an exam paper and adding in the mark scheme as well. And that is the rubric, the metric of which uh, it is measured against. And as you can see when the enter button is hit, ch chat GPT instantaneously crafts a response that is on point. We've got to be cr critical and sceptical about these things, but this is here now and our learners are using these tools. So the debate and discussion on our panel was all about AI tools and thinking about whether we need to reflect on assessment, maybe moving to more exam-based approaches under certain conditions, practical tasks, vivas, recording discussions like this in a vlog or screencast or a podcast, live in-person witness statements to capture demonstration evidence so we can get around the way that learners can now use tools such as ChatGPT. Maybe the way we've been assessing is no longer fit for purpose. Maybe we need to adapt. And we discussed this topic at length and no doubt we'll revisit this topic when it comes to the next inset day as well because it led to some heated discussion. My friend Dan He's become a bit of a, a cult AI expert superstar on Twitter. He was on Good Morning Britain the other day talking about the question of should students be allowed to use AI in assessment? Interesting topic. And some great tweets on the right hand side about the fact that this is a natural evolution of technology. This is here. We need to adjust assessment. If assessment is so old fashioned that you can just put a prompt into AI and have someone write an essay or rather something write an essay for you, then maybe the way we're assessing isn't appropriate anymore. Maybe it's outdated. But Dan argues that maybe our assessment processes need to incorporate AI skills. Maybe what we're assessing is limiting for student prospects at the moment. Laura, our head of English, put this into chat GPT. It asked it, she asked it rather to write a speech for 16 year olds with the title How Daily Activity Can Make You Happier and Healthier, taken from a recent exam and put in the prompts and added a student has started a response to this task and gave the paragraph at the bottom there to see what response she would get and sure enough in seconds got a model answer. Similarly, Laura asked ChatGPT to write a letter of application to a local sports centre applying for a part-time job, again, um, taking the jump from a recent exam question and the bullet points about what job you're applying for, why you want the job and the necessary um, key information you need to include in the response. And while it's skewed quite American in terms of the formatting of the address, you can see that it's not a bad start. This is here now. It's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Our learners are using this. Our peers are using this for administrative tasks, streamlining their workflow, freeing them up for more human tasks, arguably. Whether it be writing lesson plans, as you can see with this example on the screen right now, or whether it be allowing them to think differently about assessments. The wonderful Daniel Pink argues that there'll be a rise of more flipped classrooms, more video podcast content, as it were, as homework, a more hands-on, project-based, student-focused learning in the classroom, the live setting, as it were. Fewer take-home exams or coursework. And the rise of a new breed of oral exams, that is practicing the oratory 
skills of our learners. The dissertation meets Socrates meets TED Talk, which is a really cool way of phrasing it, I think. I read that as the rise of vlogs and podcasts and vivas and defending your essay in person with your teacher who might just pick up on the fact that maybe the student is using words that perhaps haven't been taught and they are not confident that the learner truly understands. The defence of the work in person with the teacher or assessor in an endpoint assessment style approach may be something we need to think more about. And I know many of our staff were thinking about after our recent inset day panel discussion. The second question was when should and shouldn't we use AI as a way to help assess learners? Many teachers are using this to help them. And many reputable sites such as Ditch That Textbook and their affiliated blogs and books that spiral off of it are providing cheat sheets, as it were, for teachers to use and leverage ChatGPT to help us when it comes to assessing and getting prompts and nudges from the tool to help us improve our practice. Using it to provide tutoring or coaching, tutoring or coaching rather for the students outside of lesson time. Using ChatGPT to write lesson plans, to grade assignments and quizzes. To use it for insight into big, difficult to solve problems, encouraging the students to do so as well. That using it in the classroom alongside students to investigate, interrogate and analyse problems. To use it to get extra feedback for student work. To provide students with access for lots of good examples. The moral and ethical terrain is being created before us. Ben, one of Richard's wonderful IT students, was on the panel and shared, or rather allowed me to share, his email on the screen to Richard, which come about two weeks before the inset day, where he raises the concern about fairness in a post-chat GPT world. Are we being fair? Some people will put in the hard yards and go through the mud, as it were, to learn, to discover, to reread the same sentence 20 times to understand and assimilate and then hopefully apply it and craft through books, blogs, videos, journals, and understanding, which is um, composited into an essay, the way essays used to be written. But in a chat GPT world where it can be created with a few prompts, Ben raises the question, is this fair now just to assess via the essay if this is being used and plagiarism checkers can no longer pick up on this? How are you making sure things are fair at Beacon? That's where we find ourselves. The pros and cons of using chat GPT make for interesting reading. The immediacy, the 24-7 availability, the personalised and scalable approach is attractive in an era where time is... There is no time. <laughs> we don't have much, much time as we would like. The cons are that reduction in deep thought, meaningful, hard graft and the creativity that comes from that real applicable knowledge, lack of human interaction, potential for misinformation and an over-dependence on technology as opposed to the resilience and growth that comes through really delving deep into a topic and understanding it yourself. The third question about it being fair, unbiased and ethical was a tough one and there are no clear-cut answers on this but it's the topic that we as a college are confronting head on and we are open for people sharing their thoughts, ideas, because we have an AI ethics panel formed of the IT systems team, teaching and learning team and the MIS team. And we are every month or so 
talking about the way forward because this is now, this is happening now and we need to think about what we do to make sure things are ethical, fair and as unbiased as they possibly can be and how we might learn to live with the machine as it were. My friend Dan, aforementioned in his Twitter posts, was on Good Morning Britain as I previously stated and this quote from him in this video I've attached in the slides is a suitable place to end this video. If we are teaching them something that an AI bot can do, are we teaching them the right thing? So, this video is here for anybody who wants to delve a bit deeper, but I want to wrap up this video now. Anthony asked me to share for those who couldn't attend the Inset Day session, which was electric. I loved it. It was so great to be with you all in person in the lower concourse talking about this. And there's a bit of a demand for more Inset Day sessions on this topic. I look forward to talking about it further with you. Any questions, queries, worries, concerns, please speak to me. In my role as Head of Digital Learning, I am leaning into this topic, it's fair to say, and being as proactive as possible to ensure we safeguard um, the well-being of staff and students always. That's our first priority and ensure that we are using things in the most ethical, moral and um, thoughtful, intentional way as possible. Okay, contact myself or Amara Tariq, who is our lead on artificial intelligence in our teaching and learning team. And we will endeavour to give you all the one-to-one -one support and human help that we possibly can do. Okay, you can find me in F102 and you can find Amara in the Learning Hub. Speak soon.